welcome back everybody to another reaction video. So today we're going to be continuing with our series on the Napoleonic Wars from Epic History TV. Now just um, a couple of things before we start. So apologies for the lack of a video um, last uh, Friday, I believe it was, that I missed. Um, it's just been a lot of things happening over the past few weeks that I've had to sort out. I don't really have um, time to do any uh, videos to put up so and besides that it's just been incredibly incredibly hot here in the UK uh, for the UK standards at least you know the UK just isn't built to withstand that kind of heat so uh, for example um, I recently went to my partners in America and I was just blown away that every house let alone every public building like supermarket and things like that every house seems to have air conditioning um, which just isn't a thing here in the UK we've had to put up with uh, desk fans and things like that which just aren't very effective at cooling you down so it's just been one of those months I think um, so apologies for that but um, we'll get back into the swing of things now so uh, the algorithm seemed to really like the last Napoleonic Wars video from Epic History TV so hopefully that trend continues so we'll be uh, continuing with their series now the next one is a short video it's only just over five minutes long but hopefully there'll be plenty to talk about it's um, a guide on Napoleonic infantry tactics um, which is something that I know a fair bit about so there should be plenty to discuss um, but as always, before we get started, if you want to support the channel, please consider leaving a like and subscribing. Um, I do have content coming out every week. Um, as I say last week, I did miss miss a video, but, you know, extraneous circumstances and that kind of thing. Um, but still, uh, so I do apologize for anyone that was looking forward to that and missed um, a video. So um, we'll try and compensate for that, hopefully going forward. But um, if you want to support the channel further, I do have Patreon as well. Um, there's a link to that in, des in the description below. You can check that out. Um, as always, please consider visiting Epic History TV because they are a fantastic channel and they produce, I would say, the best history documentaries on YouTube. So uh, without further ado, let's just uh, get straight into this. So this is... Uh, Epic History TV. This is um, their guide to Napoleonic infantry tactics. So let's see what they've got. In the Napoleonic Wars, infantry fought in close order, packed together, standing shoulder to shoulder. But why present such an easy target for the enemy? First, command and control. Before radios, orders had to be relayed by shouted commands, drums or bugles. Difficult in Which you could imagine was difficult to hear <laughs> when you've got thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands in these big Napoleonic battles. You've got hundreds of thousands of muskets firing almost all the time. You've got screams and shouts. You've got, you know, horses galloping thousands of them at a time. You've got cannons thundering. It would have just been completely deafening, you know, and... If anyone wants to get a good picture of what an 18th century battle, ninth, early 18th, early 19th century battle was like to fight in, um, Bernard Cornwell has done a great, you know, the author of the Sharp series, he's done a great book on the Battle of Waterloo, which is replete with um, first-hand accounts from soldiers that were actually there. And they just describe how just incomprehensibly deafening and confusing these battles are because as well, the weapons of the time produced so much smoke that you could barely see anything, you know, and they would say that all they really knew is what was going on in their sector of the battlefield. You know, they didn't, ha you know, even though the battlefields were comparatively small compared to battlefields now that, that can extend for dozens of miles, you know, in each direction, um, battles of this time you know, maybe two or three miles wide or something like that, but you didn't have a clue what was going on at the other end because there was just so much smoke and so much noise. So you can imagine how difficult command and control was. And if anyone has ever done anything like um, army cadets or anything like that, um, you'll likely know, or if anyone actually is serving in the armed forces right now, you'll know how difficult it actually is to get a body of people to move in a particular way. You know, it takes a lot of discipline. Now imagine trying to do that under fire. 
enough in the smoke and din of battle, almost impossible if troops were scattered. Second, firepower. Smoothbore muskets were inaccurate beyond about 80 yards, so volley fire, firing en masse, was the best way to inflict physical and psychological damage on the enemy. Just a quick point on that as well, about the firepower. Um, apart from riflemen, um, and riflemen were kind of a new innovation really at this time to have units that were specifically dedicated to using rifles. Um, apart from those soldiers, um, soldiers at this time weren't necessarily trained to aim, you know, like we would train a soldier now. They weren't trained necessarily to aim at a target, they were just trained to fire in a particular direction. And if anyone has actually ever fired a musket that's actually loaded with a musket ball, a shot, those things have insane recoil, you know, they they're known to like kick like mules was like one expression from a soldier in the Bernard Cornwell book you know they they really kick back really quite hard um because of that as well in the um eight, in the sort of late 18th century in the American Revolution particularly british soldiers in particular had a kind of reputation for firing too high you know their initial because of the kickback on the musket um, it would kick the gun high when it fired the ball, so the shots would sometimes go quite high. So bayonets were preferred weapons, particularly for the British. Um, you know, if you're, if you're exchanging shots with the British formation, you know, you're pretty evenly matched, but for the most part anyway. Um, but get into a bayonet charge with them, and that's where, that's what often broke a lot of enemy units. Third, morale. Soldiers were much more willing to advance into danger or hold the line if they did so together as a unit, urging each other on. And just a point on that as well, because I'm sure he'll likely get into this, but um, where British and French units, or just French units and most other units at the time differed, was that the French units would use column formations, and the reason for that was because there were a lot of conscripts in the French army conscripts you have to recruit a lot of them which means you don't necessarily have enough time to train them to a particularly very high standard compared to something like the British Army which was all volunteer troops you know the British rarely enacted conscription particularly at this time um, there's there's impressment but that's a whole other conversation um but in terms of like a national conscription um the british never enacted that it was an all-volunteer army so they were very well trained um so the british could you know use line formations pretty effectively which maximized your firepower but where column formations had the advantage is a line is very kind of brittle you know if you think of it as like a pencil you know it can snap pretty easily Whereas a column is like a sledgehammer, you know, it's just like a, a battering ram that breaks through things. But um, because columns are incredibly dense, you've got that extra sort of morale support around you because you're pretty much literally surrounded by hundreds of other troops because these columns were, you know, pretty long. If you had a column that was maybe 10 troops across, you know, you've got several thousand troops in that unit, in that brigade or whatever, you can imagine how long that column is going to be, as opposed to a line that's maybe a thousand soldiers across or something and just two or three lines deep. You know, you can imagine sort of how many troops you're going to be surrounded with if you're in a column. And that's why French columns were so notoriously difficult to break, because the morale support often outweighed the firepower that was flung into them. Fourth, defence against cavalry. Scattered infantry were easy targets for horsemen. Only by sticking together could they fight them off. The basic tactical unit of infantry was the battalion. A French line battalion had, in theory, 840 men, but in practice, nearer five to 600. Our example here has 605 men, a typical strength for a battalion on campaign. The men were divided into six companies, four fusilier companies and two flank companies. On the right, the grenadiers, made up of the tallest, strongest men, often detached to form elite all-grenadier units. And on the left, the voltigeurs, specialist light infantry used for skirmishing in front of the battalion. 
not unlike a lot of other um, military formations at the time either. You know, this was pretty much a standard kind of organization. This is pretty much how the British Army was organized. Um, instead of like instead of being called fusiliers, they were called, just called like line infantry, I, I believe, just like line battalions. But you still had like the the concept of flank companies as well. You had, you know, on the left you would have had the light infantry, and on the right you would have had the grenadiers, which, like you said, were often detached. So, say if you had, um, just for argument's sake, a company of a hundred grenadiers per battalion, say, um, and you had ten battalions, you know, you would probably what you would do is you would pull all ten of those battalions together to form one grenadier battalion or regiment. Um, organization of 18th and 19th century armies was often pretty confusing um, because you got units sort of transferring in and out and being pulled to form, you know, uh, conglomerate units and things like that all the time. So um, it, it could often get pretty confusing, but this is pretty much how most 18th, 19th century armies were organized. Skirmishers moved independently, used cover, and fired at will to harass and unsettle the enemy, while preventing enemy skirmishers carrying out the same task. And that's, oh, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> I just saw the image actually, I'd, I've not seen these videos for a long time, so I can't really remember what's in them, but um, just pausing on this image, I think this is where he's going to go, but what I was just about to say was this is where British light infantry often had the advantage, because sure you you know each battalion had a light company that would be um usually the most nimble agile you know arguably intelligent i suppose because you have to be pretty clever to know what ground to use and things like that and where the best sniping spots are and that sort of thing um but even light infantry companies in what were called line regiments you know just like your standard line infantry regiments they often ended up being equipped with rifles as well um you know, even in the American Revolution, you know, there's that myth that the Americans all used rifles and that's why they won, you know, because they could snipe at the British and things like that. It's not true. You know, the British light infantry was some of the most experienced in the world and they used um, rifles too. Um, but by the 19th century, what you've got here, you can see in this image, now these are... Um, likely troops from the 95th regiment which was made popular by the sharp series um, but there were several regiments and they ended up being called the royal green jackets because it was named after the uniform that they wore unlike the red you know the scarlet red that the british were famous for wearing these troops wore green and it was partially to differentiate them but also it gave them a bit more cover you know when they were sort of mingling in with trees and that kind of thing and these guys were armed with Baker rifles, which was the first purpose-built infantry rifle for the British Army. Before that, they would kind of use different patterns of, you know, of, of rifle design, but this was the first purpose, you know, the first rifle that the army actually ordered for itself. You know, before they would just use rifles that were pre already in circulation kind of thing that were used for hunting and that sort of thing. Um, but this was the first rifle that, you know, and I've actually held one of these, they're pretty heavy things. So, you know, you imagine trying to load and fire this thing in the heat of combat and also trying to run around and move. You know, these were pretty hefty weapons to use. Um, but this is where the British had the advantage over the French, because as well, these riflemen formed their own regiments. They weren't just the light companies of other battalions, they were their own unit. And rifles outranged muskets by sometimes a factor of at least two or three you know um baker rifles had an effective range of about two 200 yards or so you know compared to about 80 yards from a musket um and the french rarely used rifles napoleon was pretty stringently against them you know which was kind of unusual when you consider how innovative he was in other areas um but you know, it took armies quite a while to catch on to start using rifles. The British were quite early adopters of the rifle, really, when you think about it. Most armies also had specialist light infantry units for this role, such as the British 95th Rifles, French Chasseurs à Pied, and Austrian and Prussian Jäger Battalions. Jäger Battalions were another unit that also used rifles, because you think, you know, a lot of these troops were pulled from um, P 
people, you know, were recruited um, in areas, you know, where there were a lot of hunters, poachers, that kind of thing, people that knew how to shoot, you know, so, and I think Jaeger is actually, I think it translates to like hunter or something like that. Um, but these were also units known for using rifles. The traditional battlefield formation was the line. All companies formed up alongside each other, three ranks deep. Line formation maximized the number of men who could fire their muskets at the enemy and limited casualties from artillery fire. But it was extremely vulnerable to cavalry if it could be outflanked. And even for well-drilled troops, it was difficult to keep the line straight while advancing across broken ground. Some people might think, well, why is that a problem? Why do you need to keep the line straight? Well, there's the danger of setting up crossfires into yourself for one thing you know if you get units that are sort of badly angled together but also you know if you think if you've got gaps opening up like this if, if a gap opens up in a line that's pretty much it because if the enemy can get troops through there the line disintegrates pretty quickly you know especially if you can get cavalry through there you know so um moving a line in line formation was pretty difficult you know i mentioned earlier about the french preferring columns what I neglected to say was that most armies did use columns, but they mostly used them for marching. You know, a column was much easier to maneuver on a march, whereas, you know, they, the British, for example, they would march in column, obviously, but when they got to the battlefield, they would deploy into lines, whereas the French usually just stayed in column formation. So for maneuver and attack, battalions usually formed a column of divisions. This was a more flexible formation that allowed the battalion to advance quickly, though it presented a larger target to enemy guns, firing solid round shot that would tear through several ranks, and far few. Not only round shot as well, because round shot was pretty good at taking out things like barricades, buildings, you know, fortifications, that kind of thing. Um, but what you would tend to use against infantry, particularly at close range, was um, grape shot, which was um, essentially, a, you know, it, it basically turned the cannon into a giant shotgun. You know, if you think a shotgun, it fires loads of little shots, you know, like ball bearings kind of thing. Um, that was pretty similar to grape shot. You know, I think, I believe there's another name for it. I think it's canister shot, um, which was roughly the same thing. You know, that was a canister that kind of disintegrated into like a shower of lead balls, basically. You know, it was like firing a few thousand muskets, well, maybe not a few thousand, it was like firing a couple of hundred muskets all at once from the same gun. And, you know, grape shot was known to cause horrific injuries because it could just completely eviscerate, you know, entire ranks of troops. And again, if you read the Waterloo book by Bernard Cornwell, I'm not sponsored by Bernard Cornwell, by the way, <laughs> I just enjoy this book, it's a good book. Um, but if you read that, there are some accounts in there of what happened to people that were hit by canister shot or grape shot, and it's just grisly, grisly stuff. Fewer men could fire their muskets at the enemy. Theoretically, therefore, the battalion would deploy into line before reaching the enemy. Yeah, just kind of what I said earlier about that most armies would march in column, but they would deploy into line. Didn't know he was going to say that. So, uh, again, the vlogging through history curse strikes me. <laughs> if anyone watches vlogging through history, um, you'll know what I mean. He tends to say things and then the video says it straight after. So, I've just kind of coined that little term, the vlogging through history curse. But carrying out this slow maneuver under fire wasn't always possible or sensible. So some commanders kept their men in column, relying on momentum to break the enemy line. This was a risky tactic that often worked against raw troops, but led to high casualties when facing better trained infantry, like British redcoats. A column could be closed up quickly to provide protection from cavalry, or if there was time, could form a square. With bayonets fixed, the battalion formed an all-round defence that often resembled more of a rectangle. Enemy cavalry could surround the battalion but not break in as horses won't charge a solid wall of men and steel. But an infantry square was extremely vulnerable to artillery fire and could only move very slowly. 
again, if you read the Bernard Cornwell Waterloo book, I swear to God, I am not plugging, you know, I'm, I'm not sponsored or anything. I'm just plugging this because it's a good book. Um, there's a part in the Battle of Waterloo where there was repeated French cavalry charges against the Allied lines, so the Allied units formed squares. But that led them to being vulnerable to artillery, and the, as, you know, they had to stay in the square to repel the cavalry. But then the French just brought up their guns and just started basically blasting the squares to pieces at close range. And there were accounts that, you know, you have a battalion of, say, 600 men. They were reduced to just a few dozen in some cases because they sustained such high casualties from uh, close-range artillery fire. Um, now, this isn't to say that a square was unbreakable by cavalry at all, because there are instances of squares being broken, but generally speaking, they're the exception and not the norm. You know, there was an instance, I can't remember what the name of the battle was, but there's an instance in the Peninsular War. There were these cavalry from the King's German Legion, which was a British, un it was a unit under British service, but they were recruited from exiles um, from what we now know as Germany, you know, because that area had been conquered by uh, Napoleon. And Germany had ties to Britain, you know, at this time, you know, the House of Hanover that ruled Great Britain was a German dynasty. They were from Hanover, you know, imagine that. Um, so there were these sort of close ties between Britain and Germany, and sort of what we now know as Germany. Um, and these cavalry that were recruited for the King's German Legion were some of the best in the British service. And there was one particular battle where I think they broke two, maybe three French squares in like 10 minutes or something. It was ridiculously fast because one thing that you could do would be to charge the corner because if you think a corner is the weakest part of a square because if you can break through the corner you can just spill straight through and flank the square from inside so um as well you know the strength of a square depended also on the quality of the troops you know if they were raw troops they were much more likely to break than veteran troops in a square formation. So there's all sorts of things that depend on whether a formation will hold or not. You know, you can't just say form square and will repel every cavalry assault. Not always true. You know, there's multiple factors to consider. So sometimes, yes, they did break, but they were the exception, not the norm. Changing quickly and smoothly from one formation to another, especially under fire, required training, practice and experience. In 1809, the Austrian army began to use the battalion mass formation, crude but more suited to hastily trained conscripts. This was a dense column with limited firepower and huge vulnerability to enemy cannon but it could quickly close up to repel cavalry using the same principle as the square, but without the complex drill, and was much more manoeuvrable. looks like that's it so like I say pretty short and sweet video on infantry tactics um, I wanted to do this one because it is in the series so I didn't really want to miss any videos out and plus this gives a bit of context for the battles that are coming up so um, we'll be definitely continuing with this one because as I say I love epic history TV so um, we'll be continuing with the next one which is I believe the Battle of Austerlitz which is arguably Napoleon's most magnificent success um so we'll be continuing with that one um on friday so in the meantime as i say if you want to support the channel please leave a like and subscribe please consider supporting me on patreon too um i have just a couple of other announcements actually before i i um call it quits for today i have reached out to a couple of other history youtubers i won't name who they are right now because there's nothing concrete yet but i've reached out to a couple um and we're looking at doing some collaborations in the future so it won't be for a few months uh, just yet but keep an eye out for that too so hopefully that'll provide some interesting content too um i do have some ideas for original content of my own which is coming up soon uh, it won't be replacing the reaction videos it will supplement alongside them but um, I like to put more 
attention and detail into the uh, original content that I do, so that will be fewer and far between, but it'll have more effort and style and that kind of thing, so uh, keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching, and I shall see you on the next one. Thank <laughs> you.